Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am Shikha Bhaseen. I'm a senior program lead at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, and I'm very privileged uh, to be welcoming you on behalf of the Observer Research Foundation to the BRICS Academic Forum 2021. Now, as the clamor for net zero emissions gains steam, it's clear that the road to COP26 in Glasgow will be one where political considerations override any firm commitment to climate action. And yet, perhaps more than ever before, this upcoming COP26 requires the politics to allow for equitably instrumentalizing targets and ambitions under the Paris Agreement as a last attempt. The new narrative around net zero at its center, and not only is that taking away from what was promised before and how those unmet commitments relating to finance, emissions reductions, carbon market credits, technology cooperation, all, all lie unfulfilled by any measure, but it is also compounding immense pressure on long-term targets on all countries with no accountability of what needs to happen in the short and medium term. This needs a governance correction. Unless these targets are front-loaded, the limited carbon space that remains will be even more inequitable in its utilization and as the BRICS cohort of nations, this is perhaps the most significant and critical juncture to show collective leadership, to demand accountability globally, and create multilateral channels for climate cooperation closer at home. Unless we do so as part of a collective climate agenda, these steel met pressures on each of the BRICS nations will continue to rise, we are, after all, responsible for contributing to over 40% of global emissions today. But also, commonalities that affect us all will continue to be solved for in fragmented manners. So with a plethora of options that lie ahead of us to create a climate collective among the BRICS countries, an issue area that has been central to the BRICS cooperation agenda since it began in Russia in 2009, the questions of what this collective should be and what it should prioritize, and most importantly, to what end. These are critical ones that we want to discuss today. And I'm very privileged uh, to have an excellent panel of luminaries uh, to walk all of us through the several fissures and options uh, that we have ahead of us in trying to create such an agenda. Uh, allow me to introduce each one of them, please. Uh, we have with us Dr. Anna Tony. She's the Executive Director at the Institute of, for Climate and Society in Brazil. Dr. Igor Makarov, Head of the School of World Economy, National Research University, Higher School of Economics in Russia. Dr. Lan Hong, Professor and Director of the Ecological Finance Research Center at the Remnim University of China. Ms. Romy Chevalier, Senior Researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs. And finally, Ambassador Manjeet Puri, who is a former ambassador and DPR of India to the UN and currently holds the title of a Distinguished Fellow at the Energy and Resources Institute. I would like to start by asking each of these dignitaries for their views on the country priorities. So towards uh, the development of such a collective climate agenda, and how it may be able to affect the governance to tackle climate change as an issue area. Uh, if I may begin with Dr. Tony, please. Good morning. Uh, good morning, my side here, because I'm uh, speaking from Brazil, from Rio de Janeiro, actually where the Convention on Climate Change was born uh, almost 30 years ago. No. So thank you so much. I think this is a really key, it will be one of the most important COPs that we, some of us uh, will be attending. We should remember ourselves that we uh, already had problems in COP25, was supposed to be in Brazil, then was supposed to be in Chile, and then obviously end up in Spain. Last year, we did not have a COP. And now finally, we will have a COP in Glasgow. So there is a lot of expectations uh, in terms of this COP. And it's really a break or take uh, COP in terms of the climate challenge that we have. For me, uh, in, in relation to your question, this COP means the two words that we expected from this COP. Integrity and trust building. If we do not have integrity, and when I say integrity, I say integrity 
of old promises that people need to deliver. For example, the 100 billion that was promised in Paris. In Paris. We need to get that out of the table. Those uh, 100 billions per year have to be delivered so that we can have back again trust and integrity that people are talking. Unfortunately, my country, Brazil, have not been, has not been very helpful lately on either integrity or trust. Uh, for the last two years, Brazil have not been fulfilling what has been promised. Our emissions are going up. Uh, the Amazon has been burned, as, as probably many of you have heard. So we will go into this COP really lagging uh, the credibility that uh, uh, as a country that we should have to also ask for the integrity for others. So what I really wish is that in every country that goes to this COP really think that without integrity of promises that are made, they must be fulfilled and without trust among all the countries, we are not going to be able to achieve this collective governance that you suggest. Trust is fundamental. And to, in order to get trust, we need to be very integral on what we promise and how we deliver, rather than playing political games. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, Dr. Tony, excuse me. Uh, if I could actually take build on that point and ask our next uh, uh, panelist, um, Mr. Igor, to please sort of highlight um, his points of view on how we can, as a collective, try and bridge this trust gap that has also actually emerged amongst the BRICS countries themselves. Uh, over to you, sir. Hello. I'm very glad to be here. It's a privilege for me, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, actually, my hope for uh, COP26, uh, one of the hopes, is that actually BRICS countries uh, would play more important role in common efforts to reduce emissions and cope with climate change. Because the BRICS countries are absolutely crucial for preventing climate catastrophe. What are BRICS countries in terms of climate? So firstly, BRICS countries are among the largest emitters, all we know that. Uh, secondly, these countries determine the dynamics of global emissions. So most of the rise of emissions for the, last for the next decade would be uh, attributed to BRICS countries. Actually, this is a fact. Uh, thirdly, BRICS countries are specialized in production and exports of carbon intensive goods. China, Russia, India, and South Africa uh, take four first positions uh, in the world in terms of emissions embodied in their net exports. And uh, that makes, among all the other things, that makes them especially vulnerable to uh, different carbon-related barriers to international trade, so, like those which would be uh, implemented in the European Union, for example. And fourthly, and probably the most important, is that BRICS countries are actually the first uh, to move from low to middle or even to high incomes uh, under the most stringent environmental constraints. So these are the first countries that should develop, but they can't develop because of the very, very stringent environmental and fossil fuel related constraints all the humanity faces nowadays. And the uh, responsibility on the one hand and uh, the uh, necessity for BRICS countries is to develop the new models of economic and social development because these countries can't catch up just repeating the model of development uh, the Western countries have had used before uh, just based on the consumption behavior based, based on the, the rise of consumption. They can't do it and so they need some new models of economic development which are green first and which are of course inclusive. Uh, and this is uh, our responsibility, and it is not only responsibility for the world, but it is responsibility for ourselves first. And BRICS countries start, should start doing it. Uh, they have not uh, done it before because, um, uh, well, because uh, BRICS countries did not see it as a problem on the one hand and did not see it as a common problem on the other hand, but uh, they sh should do it. And uh, I think, I hope that uh, COP26 would be the first step 
uh, on um, formulating the BRICS narrative to coping with climate change and uh, the BRICS narrative to economic development in general. Uh, that is my hope, and uh, I think that uh, COP26 would be the important step on this path. Thank you for that uh, intervention. And you highlighted something that, uh, you know, is almost like we have to address that elephant in the room. You know, what do we do about the development trajectories, uh, you know, that we all are on? And how do we try and solve for it uh, through cooperative mechanisms within green finance and global green finance? Uh, you know, and, and we have to look to that for support and innovation today, uh, which is actually a really, uh, you know, it's, it's great that you actually spoke just before I'm going to invite Dr. Lan Hong, because this is exactly uh, an area of specialization that she'd be able to respond to. And so, uh, Dr. Hong, if I can please turn to you. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. it's my uh, really my pleasure to, you know, uh, discuss this interesting topic uh, uh, to with all of you. The dangers, uh, the dangers of climate change uh, in China are already uh, understand that the climate change is very dangerous. So on September 2020, President Xi Jinping delivered a speech at the 175th general debate of the UN uh, of the UN uh, meeting, announced that. China will enhance its intended nationally uh, determined contribution and adopt more effective policy and measures. Carbon dioxide emission will strive to reach a pink by 20, uh, 2030 and strive to achieve a carbon, uh, carbon neutralization by 2060. This is the major contribution China has made to implement uh, the Paris Agreement. Right now, China launched a series of occasions to promote carbon uh, emission uh, re reduction. China is uh, uh, developed an emission pink occasion plan by 2030, include a series of project arrangement, policy initiatives, and some measures to urge the implementation. The core cool is energy transformation. Uh, right now, China already just uh, already don't use coal or uh, more and more least to use coal and develop uh, the new energy. The core is energy transformation from the traditional energy to the new energy. At present, the scale of China's wind power uh, is, uh, wind power uh, installation, hundred power installation, and other new and other new energy already is ranking first in the world. For example, in twenty twenty. Uh, Five, uh, fifty-five percent of the new installed capacity of global wind power comes from China. So let's uh, China really want to do more about uh, uh, the carbon emission reduction. Uh, and the different different uh, province have a different situation because China is too big. So different province already gave different schedule and uh, occasion plan to how to reduce uh, CO2 uh, emission reduction. Such as uh, uh, such as Guizhou province. Guizhou province already uh, first is develop more new energy. Second is uh, uh, for the uh, promote uh, the um, lots of uh, new energy vehicle to install the traditional uh, vehicle, uh, and uh, also. In order to achieve emission pink as soon as possible, I think China have a very uh, uh, big occasion in, uh, uh, in green finance. 
especially climate finance. Uh, climate finance uh, in China include uh, must include two parts. If the money just invested in a project that is related to the CO2 or climate change, we don't think it is a uh, uh, climate finance. We think must first is the money must invest in uh, the climate change reduction the climate uh, change field to reduce the, the CO2 real the CO2 emission. Second is uh, master cheaper than the traditional traditional finance. So, uh, so uh, China government China government already promote a lot of the policy uh, to to increase the the climate finance for example in terms of climate laws currently china the general interest in rights for ordinary project law is around maybe uh, 7% to uh, to 8% but for climate finance project, for uh, climate project, the general interest rate is about 4% to 5%. Uh, the reason why commercial bank are willing to support climate project uh, with low interest rate, because the central bank have uh, given a uh, special support policy to climate uh, project include foster the bank foster the bank uh, climate finance laws is included into the bank's macro uh, prudential assessment and the bank right assessment and this assessment results will affect commercial banks' uh, reference from the central bank, such as how many uh, money or uh, different management of the uh, different, uh, such as uh, different policy from the central bank. Uh, for commercial bank, uh, they can uh, get uh, uh, a lot of uh, policy advantage from the central bank if they invest more uh, climate uh, project. So, uh, so uh, because uh, and also uh, central bank uh, refin uh, also central bank gave a lot of refense refense law to the climate uh, project because the central bank uh, refin refinance law interest in right is about zero to two percentage so let's uh, uh, much much law than the uh, ordinary the project because ordinary project uh, the interest in general is the seven percent to the eight percent but uh, the uh, central bank give the uh, refinance law that's interesting right is about zero percent to two percent so uh, this occasion uh, like uh, the central bank give a discount to the climate uh, project. So climate project in China right now can give low price of the uh, finance. Uh, so right now China's climate finance law balance has reached more than like uh, 12 trillion yuan. Let's I think is ranking uh, the first in in the world. Moreover, uh, Yi Gang, the governor of the Central Bank of China, said that uh, 
more special policy instruments to support climate finance will be uh, will be uh, promoted to encourage more finance investment to the climate project. So China has also made great progress in the construction of carbon uh, of carbon treaty uh, market. Uh, on the morning of uh, July 16, the National Carbon Emission Treaty Market uh, was officially launched. Uh, also, uh, also, let's, uh, it's the first, uh, it's the first, uh, let's, the, 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 the uh, whole country's national carbon made market uh, with the first of uh, venture of uh, 2,162 uh, key emissions units, uh, the power generation industrial include. And uh, also- Mr. Hong, Mr. Hong, I'm sorry, can I ask you to um, conclude your you know, initial intervention so that we can also go around the table? Okay. Okay, let's, uh, I just uh, like, uh, uh, I, I wanted to tell uh, uh, tell you right now the price, the price of the 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 carbon price right now the CO two carbon price is uh, uh fifteen yuan, fifteen yuan uh in China. Uh, right now this is really put the China's uh, uh, carbon uh, emission reduction really very good. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, let's all thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for highlighting three very critical areas that I think all countries within uh, the BRICS cohort need to think about, right? One is how are we decentralizing our own ambitions, right? So we have a national level target, but what does this mean in terms of decentralized targets and Implement in implementation plans. Uh, the second point that you uh, highlighted was uh, lowering the cost of capital because we know that that's one of the biggest challenges that all of our countries face today in in creating more um, pressure and and uh, ambition towards climate actions. And then finally, uh, you know, the development and the rollout of a carbon market. All three very very critical points that I think every country uh, within this cohort needs to think about. Um, and with that, if I could actually move, uh, make my way to Ms. Uh, Chevalier for her uh, inputs, you know, on perspectives from South Africa. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, dear colleagues, nice to see you. And greetings from, from South Africa. Um, I mean, I think it's really interesting. This conversation is, is urgent and it's pertinent. Um, and I think if I, if I start with the policy architecture, um, I think obviously that's it's it's something that sets directions for all our countries. It's uh, I mean, it's, it's key. And South Africa is clearly ahead of the game in terms of its policy architecture. We've we have a revised NDC that's in the in the um, at the process of having stakeholder engagement. So it will be ready for COP26. And we've also indicated our long term strategy 2050. Um, of how we intend to move to a decarbonized uh, society. And obviously for South Africa and, and the other countries here, that is a difficult challenge given the dependency on coal. Um, but what I think is very important is that those policy documents are in play, that they are widely accepted uh, by a broad constituency, because clearly it's not only the government's responsibility, there are a realm of, of non-governmental stakeholders that need to be on board. And that these um, that these policy documents are legislated and uh, passed by cabinet, so that there are a national, uh, e a wider economy view as to how we are going to achieve our carbon um, targets and trajectory. So it's not only a government response, and it's not only one sector that needs to be involved. It's literally kind of the vision for for where we see our countries going. And as you mentioned, um, this obviously has to be balanced very carefully with a lot of our development priorities and realities on the ground. And South Africa, like the rest of our countries have very clear um clearly difficult things that they're dealing with but that's where political leadership becomes so important uh, and and political will and um and kind of clear demonstration so the one thing that i would want to say like our other colleagues have said is that the need for political ambition is essential all our countries that especially the BRICS countries who are 
as we've mentioned, uh, huge emitters of carbon, um, our greenhouse gas emitters, uh, they need to have these policy uh, documents in play. They have to be ambitious. Um, if we are going to call other countries to be ambitious, we need to be ambitious ourselves, um, which means that need to, they need to be uh, legislated and they need to be on board and we need to be moving uh, forward. This means that our interim targets, our mid, our mid targets need to be aligned with our long term vision. And a lot of our countries are being criticized for the fact that they are not necessarily showing this long term trajectory. So they need to be realistic. Um, and a lot of criticism with South Africa's NDC is that our targets are unrealistic. So we need to show clearly how we are meet, meeting mid points and how this will align with our long term vision. The other thing that's very, very important for South Africa and clearly for other countries here, South Africa deals with massive inequality. Um, and uh, the, a lot of the rhetoric and discussion that we're dealing with is a just transition. So yes, we need to decarbonize and we need a huge, there's a huge movement at the moment towards energy transitions. But these energy transitions need to take people into account and they need to be the center of these transitions. And um, we've actually seen a presidential commission to deal specifically with our just transition to ensure that vulnerable people, as particularly women, children and poor people are at the centre of those um, of that transition. And some people do stand to lose. And how do we incorporate those people into our uh, into this transition? Um, and I'd love to talk maybe a bit more about that in the next the next session. But what I would like to say is that our countries, all of them are leading or are involved in this transition. And, and what we could do is create a kind of champion and alliance. Um, for this kind of coal dependent economy moving onwards. So um, more than ever, this transition dialogue and transition mechanisms um, is something that we all should be discussing as the, as the BRICS countries, all dealing with similar stranded assets um, and significant costs of moving our economies onwards. And then key, um, we've discussed it already, unlocking finance to assist us. We, um, yeah, we, we need assistance from developed countries. Development countries have promised us things that haven't been delivered. So COP26 will see a major push towards the climate finance agenda. And I would just love to say that the top of the South African priority list is the, is the finance around adaptation. And again, we can talk about this, but again, that's around the impacts of climate change on vulnerable people. And adaptation has always been a South African priority because very much do we align ourselves with this African agenda. And Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents um, in terms of climate impact. So that, again, is something that we would love to see some kind of opera operationalization of this global goal around adaptation. Um, and we'd like to see adaptation finance um, and, and common kind of goals in the Paris Agreement moving onwards. And then one last point is that ecosystems have to be centered to that. So there's a large discussion at the moment around ecosystem based adaptation, the role that um, forests and, and, and other ecosystems play in curbing climate change impacts. And um, I think we want to see um, you know, the, the goals and SDGs are on deforestation, land loss, and I am speaking to some of our countries here, we know who we are, but the preservation of our ecosystems is central to this, to this Paris Agreement target and achieving it. So yeah, that's all. I'll stop there, but I look forward to more discussion after it. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, you know, sort of pointing us towards these very critical development parameters that are almost instantly challenged, right? Uh, when we think about this, uh, Western world ideology or narrative of what it means to be uh, moving in a decarbonized manner or towards our global future. Um, you know, and the points that you've mentioned about just transition, I mean, I know that in India there's so much uh, work that is constantly uh, now being evaluated, you know, on what does it actually mean for us to move away from coal dependency, right? What would a just transition domestically look like? Because we want to champion that for our people just as much as the world is trying to put pressure on the BRICS countries to champion that, uh, you know, within this cohort as well. Um, and so with that, actually, I'd like to move to Ambassador Puri, please, for his... Uh, you know, his point of view on where India is at and sort of the role that we can uh, try and champion through the BRICS community. Uh, Shika, thank you very much. You know, I am uh, very delighted to be acknowledged as or embraced by academics coming from the world of practitioning. And also I'm much older than all of you. So, you know, bear with me a little bit. First, I'd like to tell you, I like the business that someone said that let's act together. You know, this game is about that. Now, I will differentiate climate action and the negotiation. And I think Professor Anatony made a very good point right at the beginning about integrity and trust. I say we are being told what is integrity and what is trust. And even though she admitted her country's situation, those who violate both integrity and trust are giving you lectures on that, please, for heaven's sake. Uh, 
let, let I can tell you all stories endlessly from any number of these uh, in the, these negotiations of you know who is to blame. Let me make one point to you all right at the beginning. Everyone here is going about talking about us being emitters. Do you know that even today the G7 emits 40% of global emissions and this is after having some 65% of what is in the stock. So, you know, what are we talking about? At least let's not call ourselves major emitters. Let's, there's a reason why I say this to you. You're all young people. I think you must understand what these negotiations are about. And, you know, many, uh, there's a lot of talk here about, you know, coming together. In the case of COVID, which we are all facing, have you seen anybody willing to come together with a simple thing like, let us share the ways and means of developing these drugs or developing the vaccines. No one's willing to even share IPRs. That is the truth of the matter. And so let us understand that the crux of decarbonization, and I think we should be very clear and separate a little bit of climate change uh, from the sustainable development agenda. That's a much wider and bigger. If you look at decarbonization, surely most of us will agree that the critical element will be technology. And there is hardly anything happening. You know, there are bland assertions. It will cost nothing. There is no problem. CCSU is around the corner. Where is it? Please tell me where it is being implemented. My last bet was some 10 years back. This big company called Southern Coal in the United States tried to do it. And the CEO was sacked after a few years because it was an infructuous investment. What has happened about hydrogen as a fuel? How much are we seeing actually actions going ahead? So, you know, look at a country like India. We took it upon ourselves in Paris that we will do it. And everybody says, you are going to be the spoilers. And we said, no, we will do what we can. And look at the targets. 450 gigawatts of renewable energy power from a country which is currently doing 100 by in the next 10 years. That's a tremendous target. And we haven't failed in reaching the targets. that We're we not asking for anything from anyone. We're just going ahead. We've now taken on an ambitious business on electric vehicles and we want to push it. We are a country with perhaps such development challenges that actually none of you in the BRICS even understand what our development challenges are. Upper capita income in real terms is below $2,000. The only country with that kind of a situation. The number of people that we need to ensure, let's say the quality of life that you have in your country is tremendous and we need to work towards it. And that's absolutely imperative. Someone mentioned here adaptation. Thank you very much. Why is adaptation a forgotten theory? For a country like India, can you imagine the number of people who just need to have those instruments such that adaptation becomes possible. So what do I want to say? When we are approaching COP20, uh, the next COP in Glasgow, whatever its number is, it's important. Yes, it's important. But will it be seminal? I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen that in the G7. What did the G7 meeting do? Reluctantly agreed upon combined goals. Nobody was willing to pony up to any individual mitigation goals. On finance, they reiterated something that President Obama said in a table where I was representing India. Nothing has happened since Copenhagen. Nothing will happen. On BRICS, I must point out to all of you, have no doubts that this extra finance is not coming our way. As we will have to go into the market, whatever finances come, and rightly so, will go to the least developed, the SIDS and those who, who they think really need it, not those who can absorb most of it, which is countries like the BRICS, etc. Have any of you paid attention to the taxonomy which is being developed on what would qualify? I don't think so. So, you know, we should try and focus ourselves on what exactly is going on. The name of the game in Britain, which is the host and, you know, which feels that it has the largest amount at stake. One is that it should be an in-person cop to show that we have overcome COVID, you know, go on and on, on with that. Because secondly, they also feel that it may give people a reason not to sign up to something or the other. And then sign up to net zero by 2050. Not as a global goal, but as individual goals. And why should you do it? Oh, because you must do it. Because we need it. I am not against net zero by 2050 or net zero by 2060, etc. But I believe the transition has to be just. The transition should take into account that continuing violation of equity and climate justice is taking place. 
And thirdly, in my opinion, the most important thing is we must be willing to do collaborations in technology. That is the crux of it. And if we will be willing to do it, I think obviously we will all come together. Collaboration is the real word. And unity, of course, I like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Puri, for uh, challenging the rest of the conversation that we have ahead of us. You know, um, I want to table a few uh, aspects that I think are important for us to think about when you know when we talk about collaboration or when we talk about us moving forward as a BRICS cohort. And you rightly pointed out that climate negotiations are very different from climate action. So on the climate negotiations front, right? When we look at all of the commitments that were made in the pre twenty twenty era. Right, which was under the Kyoto Protocol and the Doha Amendment. We know that none of those commitments have been met. And a lot of those commitments were actually very loosely defined. Right, A lot of countries sort of amplified their base here and said that we will meet these commitments, keeping that very high base uh, level of emissions as their target. And yet for the 18%, the minimum 18% that was promised uh, to have been met in terms of emissions reductions, um, less than 12% has actually been achieved, right? And in fact, if we sort of do away with uh, accounting uh, for the non-participating countries, such as US, Australia, Japan, uh, who all exited on the back of the US exit, uh, we actually see that the emission contribution that has happened has, for India alone, taken away nine years of India's emissions in terms of the carbon space that we have uh, that respects planetary boundaries, right? So if 4% of commitments have been met just in terms of emissions commitments, right? If nine years of India's emissions uh, carbon space has been taken away, uh, and this is for India, there are similar data points available for all of the countries that are here today. Um, one of the very critical areas that the BRICS community must come together at COP26 is in challenging what happened in the pre-2020 era. And if we fail to do so at COP26, we would have lost that battle completely. Um, and these numbers are not true only for the emission story, but also for the ad adaptation story, for the finance story, and for the technology and capacity building stories. So this is one area. A second area is that as we move forward into the Paris Agreement, there is a glut of CERs that remains, and there is very little a uh, transactional conversation to understand what is going to happen with these uh, CERs, right? Are they going to be invoked as part of the new market mechanism? Because really the countries who will lose out are going to be those that are on this call. Uh, and finally, a third submission that I have for the negotiation specifically is looking at the enhanced transparency framework that is being pushed forward uh, in quite a critical manner in terms of the kind of reporting that they want to come out of what were not a part of the Annex One countries, uh, you know, in the previous two treaties. Um, and I think somewhere the conversation has actually forgotten that transparency is supposed to create fairness and integrity and trust. And in fact, this conversation within the negotiation has become the most intransparent conversation that we have. So as a collective, and this is what I would really like to sort of, you know, hear from each of the speakers, and if it's okay, we'll go in the same, um, you know, um, order as we did before, to understand, you know, what is your vision for how the BRICS countries can come together as a negotiating block, uh, you know, to try and nudge more and more responsibility towards adaptation, but also accountability and just transitions. And then as a collective, where do you see us cooperating, um, you know, amongst ourselves as a cohort, you know, and, and let's try and make this effort so that uh, Ambassador Puri's, uh, you know, very um, honest acknowledgement of how multilateralism is failing, you know, we can try to at least imagine correcting for it. Um, so if I could, uh, again, please start with Dr. Tony um, in sort of responding to the submission. Thank you, and really interesting listening to all my colleagues. Uh, I think, I mean, to say the truth, I think we are our worst enemies uh, within BRICS in, in the sense of that we, as you just talked about, we don't get our act together among us because together we are so powerful. But we have been failing time and time again 
uh, of acting together. And this makes us terribly vulnerable towards, you know, obviously, the other powers that's there. But I can, I mean, we have everything to, you know, to, to help us on that. For example, China and India are the biggest uh, importers of Brazilian uh, agriculture products, meat and soya, that are destroying the Amazon. So if we were able to come together to find ways to have, uh, no, to have these organized, we would not be you know, exposed to complaints for, from other countries that it, you know, imports very little from Brazil on that you know, soya and beef. Now, Russia and Brazil, we have huge forests. So if we were together come and speak up, it, it would obviously will feel much more important. I think our colleague from South Africa also and India also mentioned about just transition. Who better to put a proposal on the table about just transition and adaptation than the BRICS countries? But somehow our governments are not aligned together. They have different interests. They are different companies. So I'm of the one that, I mean, we can, I mean, we have done, we spend a lot of our time saying what we do not like from developed countries. And we are absolutely right to say so because there are many things that we don't like. But I think our energy should be on building this alliance among us, you now focus and prioritize rather than just saying what we don't want. Because in the end of the day, climate change will affect our countries worse than any other countries. It's our people that are going to be dying. So it is in our interest that climate change is dealt with. It is in our interest that you know, obviously emissions will go down, that yes, we do you know, have you know, net zero by 2050s. It should be you know, the BRICS countries that put those flagships there should be the BRICS countries that can come up to a meeting and say, you know, we are for integrity, we are for trust building, and you guys are not. But because we cannot organize ourselves, we obviously spend a lot of our time saying individually, we don't like this or we don't like that, and really lose our power. So I, I mean, I, I, I wish our government, and I can again say, speak by, you know, from the Brazilian government, is, is have no interest on uh, agreeing with, for example, China or India or South Africa. Just the opposite is just there begging for little things from developed countries. So uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to come at COP26 united as we should. But if governments are not, so should be civil society, academics. We can speak for ourselves. So the national governments, we can see that they want. So uh, again, I think it's that's why I really like um, this uh, debate because we need to take the power in our own hands, even if our own governments do not do so at this moment. Thank you, Dr. Tony. And moving to you, Dr. Makarov, um, can we take this in our own hands? You know, when governments and political will is not reflecting the sense of uh, collective action. You know, can civil society and non-party observers come together to make this happen? Yeah, thank you. I actually fully support Anna that we should focus on uh, what we do not like in what uh, G7 countries propose, but uh, on uh, what we would like to propose ourselves. Uh, we should, we BRICS countries, I mean, uh, should uh, try to build our own vision of how the global decarbonization should be implemented. Uh, we should try to develop our own narrative of global climate agenda, which is uh, closer to our national interests, to our development interests. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, joint um, proposals of BRICS countries uh, would be anyway much stronger than individual proposals of uh, ourselves separately. Uh, and I think that there are at least three uh, major principles of global climate agenda that each BRICS country would support. The first principle is that for reduction of global emissions, two sides should be addressed, production with technologies and consumption with consumption patterns. 
technologies may help and they are absolutely crucial i, I agree but uh, preventing catastrophic climate change without uh, revising the consumption patterns is impossible and this emphasis on consumption is important at the international level because uh export oriented countries like BRICS countries uh, they create their own emissions not for themselves but also for consuming countries for g7 countries and uh, we should take our common responsibility for these emissions uh, so chinese emissions are not only for china they are on also for producing goods that are then consumed in us in the european union and so on the same is true for russia the same is true for uh, south africa for india as well and so on uh, so i think that this principle uh, is absolutely important and it also applies for the um, agenda within countries because of course the major burden from reducing emissions and this burden is very significant it should not lay on the poorer population because uh, climate agenda should be linked of course with the agenda of inequality the agenda of uh, coping with poverty and so on and there are many many options uh, to link these agendas uh, one option is just to link income taxation progressive income taxation both globally and nationally with carbon taxation there are instruments like that and i think that many instruments like that they may be used somehow in BRICS countries and they may be promoted globally to make these instruments international and this is the second principle that coping with climate change should be linked with solving other development problems and especially the problems of poverty and equality and i think that all the BRICS countries should, should, will uh, support this principle and the third principle is that uh emissions should be reduced globally i mean where it is cheaper to reduce them now we have a symmetry we have developed countries g7 countries which have abundant sources of green finance available for green projects but they have no cheap green projects they have already reduced emissions in the cheapest way they have already used the cheapest options to reduce emissions in BRICS countries and in other developing countries there are many many options to reduce emissions cheap so we have many, many low carbon projects, potential low carbon projects, but we have no available green finance. So the, one of the major uh, one of the major objectives of the global climate negotiations, of global uh, effort to reduce uh, emissions and to cope with climate change is, is to bridge this gap, this gap of climate finance and the, uh, to, to uh, cope with this asymmetry to make the bridges between uh, sources of green capital and the real cheap low carbon projects which are available in our countries, but we have no cheap capital to implement these projects. There are many, many instruments to do it, uh, starting with offsets, Article 6 uh, on the Paris Agreement, but, uh, and uh, like uh, green standards, which should be unified all over the world, of course, to um, facilitate this uh, flows of capital, of green capital, and so on. But uh, nowadays, within the negotiations, they are discussed separately. And I think that it is our objective of BRICS countries, which are the most interested in this uh, global system of green finance, uh, to propose to make it more integrated, to make it uh, more comprehensive, and uh, to make it really working. Uh, and so I think that this third principle that emissions should be reduced where it is cheaper to reduce them, it is uh, it would be supported by all the BRICS countries, and so uh, of course it may be one of the points we may promote uh, in negotiations, including probably in Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very uh, interesting uh, proposals being tabled, which I think uh, would make for an entire uh, other discussion altogether. Actually, looking at trade and production parameters, you know, green standards, uh, availing the cheapest form of capital for the right kind of projects. But I think what's interesting is how you said, right, like um, the cost of capital. I think that's a really big concern that affects all of the BRICS countries uh, quite uniformly. Um, and so would that perhaps, Dr. Dr. Lang, uh, be an area of cooperation that you can imagine uh, China also being interested in partnering with its other BRICS counterparts? Uh, and also your sort of opinion on uh, what is the role of non-party stakeholders you know, moving forward? Yes, no. yes. Yes, right now China already think uh, the uh, the climate change is most uh, 
big challenge for the China and uh, uh, as the the main task for all the society, no matter the banker or government or 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 people, uh, such as all the work right now, uh, all around the with the 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 carbon emission reduction. Uh, be, be, for example, before green finance, the green have different means, such as such as uh, uh, the the air pollution or water pollution. But right now in China, if we call about green finance, that is mostly is climate uh, finance because uh, uh, the government already said the green finance the the core task is support the 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 uh, uh, carbon emission reduction so and also you know uh, the we already put a lot of work uh, for promote the carbon reduction but really we need uh, i think cooperation is very very important uh, because the 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 CO2, the, the carbon dioxide uh, is moving or globally, moving globally. So such as uh, China and uh, uh, Russia and all the country, uh, uh, we face the same same environmental problem, not like uh, the SO2. SO2 is a short, uh, short, uh, short traveling. So let's just uh, uh, one country. See, it seems is one province problem, environmental problem. But the CO2 is different. That is a whole global problem. So uh, I think uh, uh, the cooperation is very important right now china exactly promote the carbon uh, carbon re uh, emission reduction very hard but also face a lot a lot of challenge yes for the total emission a lot of people uh, like talk about the, the total emission right now china ranking first ranking one since china is the most big countries for the total carbon emission but but for the yes for the poor capital carbon emission for the poor capital of carbon emission let the china seems very low because china have lots lots of people and uh, yeah let's china's situation we cannot uh, change this situation so we reduce the carbon emission the challenge very Big second is uh, we all know the coal can emit a lot of carbon CO two carbon dioxide, but China has lots of coal. Of course, right now we already gradually don't use coal, such as for the uh, for the green finance or uh, we already uh, don't include any coal project inside even the clean coal before clean coal uh, also put in the green finance because it's the clean clean coal but right now uh if we have coal no green don't think it's green so i think china but uh, let's uh, it's market right market and uh, because China have lots of coal, so the coal is cheaper, and other energy is how uh, how prices, how price, so how to you know how to make so many cost for uh, for transfer the energy to the new energy. It's really a challenge for the China and uh, yeah. China. Yes, yes, China really do a lot of things and. Uh, also, China want to do more, and uh, I think uh, the whole countries and the whole world together to do these things is very important because this is like uh, a public goods. It's like uh, the 
the whole world public goods. And uh, I think China, yes, we have a lot of people. And uh, yes, we right now is rank first for the carbon emission. And so we need to put a lot, lot, lot of um, effort to promote the carbon uh, emission reduction more. Uh, and uh, I think China already do a lot. And but, but I think we also need help. We also need cooperation. We also need uh, such as technical and uh, also such as finance market cooperation and all other cooperation because yeah there's lots lots of challenge but i okay. think it's very very important things for our uh, people uh, so let's uh, we are face the the same uh, the challenge like uh, yes. how human being can uh, can survive su survive uh, longer and uh, uh, survive can uh, sustainable like uh, so China is a very important country and uh, we will right. do our best. Yes, thank you. That, thank you, Dr. Hong, for sort of like, um, you know, reiterating the, the size of the mammoth challenges that lie ahead of all of us and how, of course, at a national level, uh, you know, there's a lot of effort that is going towards um, get, getting there to trying to solve for it uh, in our own national capacities. But perhaps there's, uh, you know, more that we can do as a consortium coming together, even if the political will is not very high. And uh, Ms. Chevalier, you had actually uh, alluded to a lot of these issues in your opening interventions, right? Uh, if I could turn to you to sort of understand how you think, uh, you know, a, a step forward maybe, and if I could request you to keep uh, your interventions to about a minute, minute and a half, that would be yes, great. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. So um, I completely agree with the other speakers that a united front on these issues is, is, is key to a successful outcome. Uh, 26 and beyond in, in general, um, that we are much more powerful together than we are alone. Um, and in terms of just every, I mean, we can see just the, the array of different things, climate finance, technology, we're all at different stages and we can all assist one another. So absolutely dialogue, cooperation, especially around the just transition, I think. Um, In-house, we have a lot of expertise and, and technology and other and other parts of tools that we can assist one another with. I also think the um, reference to non-state actors is, is key. I mean, we've seen a huge movement in the last years around the new actors taking on commitments. So we see even at a, at a sub-national level with cities and mayors coming forward to say, well, my country's not moving on this, so, but we can. Um, and essentially, I, I think with the private sector and the financial institutions, it's key. And we've seen lots of asset managers and others come in, come in forward to say, okay, well, this is, this is what we can put forward. And I think civil society is key in accountability. So it is really important, um, more, now, more so now than ever with the failure, as you say, of pre-2020 commitments is that, that there's a major push from civil society and from other actors to say not enough not quick enough let's let's move um so I, I definitely think that is important and and there is a lot of momentum this kind of race to zero all the cities and businesses philanthropists making commitments is very very at least heartwarming um but again making sure that that the policy architecture that's in place is actually implemented and i think that's the biggest issue is that it's all good and well to to have these amazing intentions but if we actually look at ndcs and, and long-term strategies that have actually been implemented and are in policy and legislated, it is so few, and we're not meeting what's required to keep our temperature goal to 1.5. And if we keep in the back of our minds what that means for vulnerable people, and, and that's the heart and, of our intention, then we really, really need to move quickly. So yeah, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very, very pragmatic opportunities in terms of actors. Uh, so Ambassador Puri, uh, should the financiers talk more to each other? Should the technology collaborators, you know, look to cooperate much further, you know, than our own borders? Um, and will such cooperations actually reinstill the hope back in multilateralism in tackling climate change? I said okay. we must collaborate. We must talk to each other. That's the need of the hour and the need of humanity. That goes without saying. You know, four of us are bound together in the basic, and we do exert a great deal of pressure within the G20, which is the principal arm of negotiation. It would be great if the Russian Federation would also come on board. There's no doubt about that at all. Let me make two points to you. One, technology cooperation. 
that is absolutely the key and here i want to say something it's not just the question of collaboration in the sense uh, i talk to you will you make it available no it's the development of technology you know carbon came about because the human mind thought of some kind of fuel in a particular manner now we want to remove carbon from the equation what are we doing about it precious little and frankly if the greatest most powerful countries in the world did something on it the rest of us would take it then i want to make one more point the last one on finance you know let's be very clear that the expressions the definitions in fact the taxonomy on finance if it gets done in a manner that the developing countries forget large ones that developing countries can use it would be absolutely great so president tony we know what we want we are just not it because the other sides and the demand doers put pressure and the fact of the 135 of us the what we have to bear is what is the outcome of the things which is why sometimes it looks as if we are defending we are not in 1992 a very sweet time in global relations you could put forward these ideas today as you me and all those around this table grow and challenge a particular hegemony i am afraid the demand yours are the others because we are actually doing well but we must do well green and in a sustainable manner thank you thank you ambassador puri um that's actually drawing us to uh, to the close of our hour and i want if there's one thing right that i think we absolutely must take away from this conversation is that we cannot rely on political will whether that is through the entirety of the cop processes or of our own government uh to wait for climate change action to take place right the politics will have to follow the action and there are two very clear areas where a uh, collaborative action right not just conversation and dialogue although that's also very important needs our attention one is on creating a financial taxonomy that is equitable and on technology co cooperation and collaboration that responds to not only uh, the decarbonization trajectories that we want to set forth for ourselves but also ensures that we're meeting the development goals uh, that uh, allow for prosperity within each of our national boundaries um with that i'd like to thank all of my panelists uh, again today for being here and um you know our thanks also to ORF for kindly hosting all of us on this very interesting platform uh, and i hope to continue the conversation with all of you thank you Thank you Shika thank, thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you a lot thank you thank you all for taking the time thank you thank you